So welcome all to this Alexander Alumni Talk seminar with Martin K. Dimitrov talking about the Chinese Communist Party and Catherine Owen as a discussant. It's uh, such a great pleasure of having both of these excellent broad-based scholars and experts uh, here with us today. And they're also, of course, our dear former visiting fellows, Martin uh, 2013 and 14 and, and Catherine 2019, just before Martin was here that year. Yeah, and so then just very briefly introducing the speakers before giving the floor to them. So Martin Dimitrov is a professor of political science and director of graduate studies at Tulane University and has a vast uh, expertise on fields uh, covering post-communist and communist political regimes across an area from Russia to China and Eastern Europe to Cuba. And he has two uh, upcoming books this year, uh, a dictatorship and information autocratic regime resilience in communist Europe and China with Oxford University Press and I think Martin you just submitted the manuscript congratulations uh, and the adaptability of the Chinese Communist Party with Cambridge University Press the took uh, book that uh, he's uh, talking about today and uh, Martin's previous publications include books like um, piracy and the state the politics of intellectual property rights in China uh, why communism did not collapse, understanding authoritarian regime resilience in Asia and Europe and the political logic of socialist consumption. And Dr. Catherine Owen uh, is a senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Exeter. And like Martin has truly a vast scope of expertise covering Russia, China and, and Central Asia. And uh, she has published extensively on uh, topics like participatory governance under authoritarianism, Russian and Chinese activities in Central Asia and Africa, and decolonial and non-Western approaches to knowledge production in the IR. And two of her most recent publications from this year are uh, uh, articles uh, titled Mapping Russian Illicit Finance in Africa, the Cases of Sudan and Madagascar, and Participatory Budgeting and the Party, uh, Generating Citizens' Orderly Participation Through Party Building in Shanghai. So welcome, uh, both of you. And uh, note, as you see, that we are recording uh, now, and we'll record uh, Martin's talk and Catherine's comments, but we will not be recording the Q&A session. And in the Q&A, you can just raise your hand and post uh, the question directly, or you can send your questions uh, in the chat. OK, thanks. And so, Martin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for uh, this opportunity to um, come back to Alexanteri um, in this alumni uh, talk series. Um, it's a, my, I have amazingly fond memories of my times in Helsinki and the community at Alexanteri, and I'm very glad that a part of this community is joining us today. I'm also very excited that Catherine um, uh, has agreed to be a discussant uh, on this talk, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share a portion of this book that I'm still in the process of writing. So at this point in, in the writing process, the feedback is exceptionally helpful and most appreciated. So I will share my uh, screen and I have uh, prepared a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Uh, this um, PowerPoint presentation um, is introducing the overall project and one sub part of it or one part of it that I will focus on. So the title of this uh, book that I am uh, completing is The Adaptability of the Chinese Communist Party. It will be out at the end of 2022 or early in 2023 with Cambridge University Press. The uh, motivating question for this uh, book is how did the Chinese Communist Party respond to 1989? Of course, this is a question um, that has been examined by many others in the past. We have no shortage of answers. Repression is a part of the response to 89, but it's not sufficient to explain how the Chinese Communist Party has adapted uh, to the collapse of communism in Europe and to the domestic upheavals of 89. So what I'm arguing in this uh, book is that in addition to repression, there are four types of adaptation. One is expanding the scope of private activity. Another one is extending the social safety net. A third one is promoting indigenous cultural consumption. And the fourth one, which I will focus on today, is rival incorporation through organizational inclusion. 
The overarching question about each of those adaptations is how much longer will they be effective? And what I argue in this book is that although these adaptations have helped the Chinese Communist Party survive and thrive for more than three decades after 89, each one is showing various signs of malfunction, and that has implications for the future. So what I will do today is very briefly, I will go back to the collapse of communism in 89-91 and the domestic uh, upheaval that China underwent at that point in time. And then I will talk about one response to 89, namely rival incorporation through two different avenues, one and the main one being the Chinese Communist Party, but then I will also very briefly discuss some auxiliary mechanisms of rival incorporation and assess uh, their effectiveness. And at the end of the talk, I will uh, discuss the limits of rival incorporation, and then I will have some implications for the future. So as we all uh, know, this is uh, 1989 in Beijing. Uh, there were protests in Beijing, uh, in Tiananmen Square, and in another 340 major cities throughout China. 89, of course, was a global event. Here we have the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Communist countries greatly shrank in terms of their geographical extent uh, between 88 and 92. And the period after 89 ushered in um, a time of serious thinking about the future in China. One answer to how uh, communist regimes survived is provided in this volume that Anna referenced in her very kind uh, introduction. But what the volume aimed to do was to provide a general theory that applies to both the countries that um, collapsed and the ones that survived, what adaptations apply to the universe of communist regimes. And what I'm doing in, in, in the book about which I'm talking today is I'm providing an answer that is more specific and it relates to the Chinese case and the communist party as front and center in that answer. So, what I'm interested in is this concept of rival incorporation. Um, and of course, it's something we need to define. The simplest definition is inclusion. Inclusion of troublemakers, potential rivals to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and the different mechanisms. Um, there's very influential work on legislatures. Uh, there's newer works on, uh, newer work on cabinet positions um, where I, stand on both of these um, arguments is that, of course, both legislatures and cabinets provide mechanisms for rival incorporation, but they tend to be small. I mean, there are only so many seats in the legislature, typically a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand in the case of China cabinets, a few dozen positions. So um, in terms of incorporating potential rivals, they can be used for a very small subset of, of those rivals. And what I'm interested in, um, in in this talk today is broader mechanisms for rival incorporation. And one such mechanism is provided by nationwide organizations, um, such as the Women's League. Um, I will briefly talk about the All China Women's Federation at the end and a couple of other mechanisms. Um, and what I argue is they're auxiliary mechanisms. They're not the main mechanism. Uh, the most effective mechanism is the party. And you know, here I, I side with Svolik and others, um, you know, but Svalik um, makes a very cogent argument about the effectiveness of parties because of their capacity to engage in the hierarchical assignment of services and benefits. So parties matter, single party regimes uh, outlast, um, multi-party autocracies and autocracies that don't have political parties. But what is important to me is that within the group of single party regimes, there is a subtype, which is the communist single party regimes which actually lasts the longest of any type of authoritarian regime. So both the ones that collapsed were in fact quite long lasting and the ones that survived to the current day are exceptionally long lasting. So what I'm interested in is what specifically um, it, it is about these communist parties that allows them uh, to last such a long time. And of course, the answer is not simple because these parties have many features. But one aspect that I'm focusing on today is this capacity for rival incorporation. So all communist parties are Leninist, not all Leninist parties are communist. So there's one Leninist party that is not communist, and that is the KMT, uh, which ruled in Taiwan. And what I'm interested here in terms of Leninist is just the organizational structure. It has nothing to do with the ideology of the party. So this organizational structure, I argue, 
confers advantages to Leninist parties. And the two advantages that matter in terms of rival incorporation are the depth of penetration of the party. Uh, it can go very, very deep down to the grassroots. And then the breadth. So this is its um, horizontal penetration of di different sectors of society. So Leninist parties are exceptionally adept at achieving breadth and depth. The Chinese Communist Party is a Leninist party, of course. And then the question is, how has it approached party building? This is the technical term for enhancing the strength of the party, how it has approached party building since 89. So what I'm going to do is I will um, do a lot of this combination of three things. So I will first focus on three different indicators, uh, which are um, general indicators of strength of the party. And I will review um, the statistics that I've collected on this. I've collected a, a big data set uh, for, this, for this project of generally hard to find um, statistical data. Um, so I will look at the increasing membership of the party at the higher number of party structures, party branches um, and party committees, and at the improving level of education of party members as general indicators of increasing strength of the party. So remarkably, the Chinese Communist Party has nearly doubled in size uh, from 89 to 2021. The latest statistics we have uh, were um, uh, made available shortly before the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party last summer. So they're from June 2021. So the party increased from um, slightly below 50 million members to 95 million members over this 32 year period. This is a remarkable achievement. Um, another illustration of uh, the successes in party building are uh, provided by uh, this table of party branches. Whenever there are three party members in, in a location, um, they, they form a party branch. Under 50, they form a general branch, and then 100 and above, they form a party committee. So um, these party structures have greatly increased since 89 as well. Um, and then the third indicator of, of strength is the improving educational attainment of party members. Um, it's not widely appreciated that at the moment when the Chinese revolution uh, succeeded, the Chinese Communist Party was a party of illiterate uh, individuals. So levels of illiteracy among party members stood at 69% in 49. And by 2000, which is the latest year for which I have this indicator, they were down to 2.5%. Uh, um, so at the same time, with the declining illiteracy of party members, we had a great increase in the number of individuals who had an associate's degree or higher. So higher than associates is bachelor's, master's, PhD. Uh, but you know these individuals have at least an associate's degree. Um, so in 49, considerably less than 1% of party members had an associate's degree or higher. By 2021, over half of party members had such a degree. So this is no longer a party of illiterates. It's a party of individuals that have at least an associate's degree and um, generally um, something higher than that. So all of these um, um, three indicators are, are positive general uh, indicators of improving strength of the party. Now, um, of course, nothing is um, um, just black and white. So when we're assessing party building in China, there are a few indicators that for the time being I will present as ambiguous, and then I will argue that, that they're actually um, uh, alarming for the party. Elitism, having an older party base and having fewer applicants, because of course, in order to join the party, you have to apply, there's a vetting process and only a subset of those who apply end up joining. So here I'm assessing enthusiasm for joining the party by looking at the applications. So what can we say about elitism? So this is a party that emerged and according to its um, constitution is a party of workers and peasants. And what we see is that there are a lot fewer of both of these categories. So there are a lot fewer peasants and there are a lot fewer workers in the party. Jointly, as of 2021, workers and peasants constitute a third of party members, which then raises the question, well, who are the other two thirds? The government bureaucrats, they're private entrepreneurs, uh, they are um, individuals with high levels of education. So the party is moving from its original characteristics um, towards a more elitist group of party members. A second um, indicator of change um, is the changing of uh, age structure of party members. Um, the number of retirees in the party 
because in China, men still retire at 60 and women retire at 55, and in some cases, as young as 50. There have been discussions for over 10 years that the retirement age should be raised. This has not occurred. So when we're looking at members who are 61 or older, those individuals are definitely retired. So these retirees are now uh, constituting almost 30% of party members in China. And a party of retirees, uh, of course, is less dynamic than a party that is full of young people. Um, and um, this, this is um, a development that is uh, a cause uh, for concern. And then we have this, uh, which is surprising um, in this uh, finding it, about the applications for membership. So the latest year for which this data is available is 2019. Um, even though other data on uh, the development of the party have become available for 2020 and 2021, not uh, no statistics on applications for membership. But what we see here is that after 2015, there was a considerable drop in the number of applications. So those are millions of individuals. I gave this talk to a different audience last night and they asked me about, you know, what are the axes? So millions of individual applicants per year. And, you know, this has greatly decreased. Um, and the question is, what is driving this? There's no discussion in the English or Chinese language literature of this trend. Uh, we might think, well, there are fewer younger people in China. Um, that is correct, but the drop didn't occur in 2015. The only other time when there was a rapid erosion in the number of, of applications for party membership was immediately after Tiananmen, where there was a 20% drop in applicants to join the party. So um, fewer applicants is not welcome news for the Chinese Communist Party because it means that in order to increase its membership, it has to adopt, it has to accept most of these applicants. So it has to become less discriminating um, and you know, less competitive to join the party, less of a prize and therefore less desirable to be a party member. Um, so those trends are not um, welcome by the party. So what we have therefore is the coexistence of dynamism and ossification. So we have signs of dynamism, increasing party size, party structures, educational achievement of party members, and at the same time, we have signs of ossification, fewer applicants, older membership base, and a more elitist party. The coexistence of ossification and dynamism makes for uncertain future. So this is the general um, 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 overview of um, the party strength um, uh, in, in terms of the depth of penetration. And now I'm going to move to the breadth of penetration by focusing on three uh, sectors, which I use as examples. You know, one could do more than that. Penetration of educational institutions, penetrations of non-governmental organizations in China, and penetration of private firms. I have picked these three because in Western political science theorizing, um, students, um, non-governmental organization and private firms are considered to be entities that are opposed to um, uh, the communist party and to communist rule. And what we will see is that in the case of China, uh, there appears to be a rather um, 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 successful uh, relationship, um, symbiotic relationship between the party and these three entities. So party building in educational institutions, Elizabeth Perry from Harvard and her student, uh, former PhD student, Yan Xiaojun, have argued uh, persuasively about the um, extraordinary importance that the Chinese Communist Party um, attaches to establishing control over domestic educational institutions. Um, the data that I've collected indicate uh, that there is near complete penetration of uh, universities, institutions of higher learning, with party committees. Um, the latest data I have on this issue is from 2000, when only three of the more than 1,000 universities in China at the time had not yet established party committees. Um, so um, what we have is this near complete penetration domestically. We also have um, very interesting, more recent developments of efforts to control overseas um, students um, through the Chinese Students and Scholars Associations. Um, there's very little research on this um, in English. Uh, it's hard to research it, but you know, one source is again, Yan, Yan Xiaojun and his uh, PhD student, um, uh, Mohammed al Sudairi. Um, so um, the, one of the um, examples of this breadth of penetration is the educational institutions. 
Um, another is party building in social society organizations, which in the West we uh, call NGOs. Um, this is, um, I think, uh, a very interesting uh, um, empirical um, illustration of the zeal with which the Chinese Communist Party has approached uh, this task of establishing party committees in NGOs. And as of 2017, uh, almost two thirds of these NGOs had party committees. For reasons that are unclear in 2018, the number of uh, party branches, general branches and party committees in um, NGOs declined. Um, and the latest data point is from 2018. Um, now, should this decline um, continue, then this would have implications for how the Chinese Communist Party assesses its success in, in party building in these um, NGOs. And the third indicator of, of the breadth of the reach of the party is party building in private firms. Doctrinally, um, communism and capitalism uh, don't, um, don't uh, 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 are not compatible, but obviously uh, we all know that in the case of China, this is not the case. Um, it is not as widely um, appreciated, however, that um, private firms have been building party cells. And today, most private firms in China have a party committee on site. Um, so that is um, an illustration of the capacity of the Chinese Communist Party to ensure wide sectoral penetration. Um, again, as with the NGOs after 2017, there's a dip in the number of party committees and the data stops in 2018. So I can't comment on what it looks like since then, uh, but eventually that data presumably will become available. So um, we can move on um, having um, discussed these successes in party building towards some problems uh, that the Chinese Communist Party is facing. Uh, it's not all um, successful and good news. Uh, there's, I mean, and here I will use three examples to illustrate problems of rival incorporation of ethnic minorities, of system critical intellectuals, and um, of party building in Hong Kong and Macau. So with regard to ethnic minorities, um, if we look at this graph, we can say that the number, I mean, the proportion of ethnic minorities in the Chinese Communist Party is roughly equivalent to the proportion of the uh, general population. So depending on what source we look at, minorities constitute either eight or 9% of the Chinese population. And by 2021, they were at 7.5% of the Chinese Communist Party. So roughly on par. However, um, if we look at this uh, table, uh, which you know, this data is very, very hard to get. So I only have it for 2006. I don't have it for any year prior to that or any year since. But the 2006 data reveals, I think, some very interesting patterns. Um, so here what I'm comparing is the share of um, the, the Han majority in the overall population and in the Chinese Communist Party. So they're overrepresented in the party. And then I am presenting four different minorities of the 55 minorities that exist in China. Some minorities are overrepresented in the party, um, Koreans and Mongols in this graph, and then others Uyghurs and Tibetans are underrepresented. And this underrepresentation is especially noticeable in the case of Uyghurs. Uyghurs and Tibetans, as we know, have a history of ethnic unrest. And what we've learned from studies of nationalism and nationalities is that one response to ethnic um, dissatisfaction and problems of penetration of ethnic minorities is co-optation of members of the minority um, through uh, membership in institutions such as the Communist Party. So this co-optation does not appear to be proceeding very well uh, um, when we use the indicator of party membership for the Uyghurs and the Tibetans. Moving on to another um, problematic group in terms of incorporation in the party, system critical intellectuals. Political scientists have argued that they're two models of handling system critical intellectuals. And one is the pre-89 Eastern European model where these intellectuals were left outside the party. So Václav Havel, 
the noted playwright who then became president of Czechoslovakia and eventually of the Czech Republic, one of the signatories of Charter 77, was outside the Communist Party. And then Vladimir Tismaniano has argued that in China, there's a different model, which is that system critical intellectuals are integrated in the party. However, this doesn't always take place. So here I've presented a list of some of these system critical intellectuals. It's notable that this list spans over four decades. I mean, obviously you can't list everybody, but there are not that many uh, of these individuals who operate outside the party, but more might emerge in the future. So this is certainly um, something that the party is mindful of as a potential uh, challenge, these system critical intellectuals and the importance of incorporating them. And moving on to the third challenge, uh, the penetration of Hong Kong and Macau. So there's very much that we don't know, which is why this slide is split up into what we know and what we don't know. Um, so what we know about the Chinese Communist Party, we know more about Hong Kong. Um, what we know about Hong Kong is that before the 1997 um, handover, the Chinese Communist Party operated in Hong Kong underground through the Xinhua News Agency. Um, and then after 1997, it has been operating through the liaison office. Um, the Chinese Communist Party supports the biggest political party in Hong Kong, the Democratic Alliance for the Betterment of Hong Kong. It also supports the Federation of Trade Unions in Hong Kong. All right, well, what we don't know is we don't know basic, basic facts. Uh, first of all, we don't know what the membership size of the Chinese Communist Party in Hong Kong and Macau is. Basic statistics have never become available on this issue. Secondly, um, the Chinese Communist Party uses a nomenclatura system to appoint individuals to various government positions. We don't know whether this system is used in Hong Kong for appointments to government institutions. And um, in terms of the sectoral penetration, we don't know about the party presence in educational institutions, social organizations, NGOs, and firms. So um, we, don't, we don't know about that, uh, but you know, signs of unrest in Hong Kong um, are indications that uh, penetration of, of Hong Kong uh, is not proceeding as smoothly as the party might want it to. So there are some challenges uh, in terms of uh, party penetration. At the same time, there are significant successes. So in terms of party incorporation, which is the main vehicle for rival incorporation in China, there are certainly some successes, important successes, but there are also ongoing challenges. Now, I will move on to discussing briefly another avenue for rival incorporation, and this is non party incorporation. So there's some auxiliary mechanisms, uh, the Women's Federation, trade unions, and most important of the three is the last one, which is the United Front Work Department. So let me briefly talk about each one, and then I will conclude and we'll move on to um, Catherine's uh, comments and then to discussion. Now, the first mechanism, uh, which is outside the party uh, for potential incorporation of rivals is provided by a, a, a huge nationwide organization that had parallels in all communist regimes, the All China Women's Federation. It has very deep grassroots presence, over 685,000 grassroots organizations, and it, it is a very important employment opportunity um, for the 7.8 million full-time executive members. So these are women whose job it is to staff these uh, grassroots offices of the Women's Federation. However, beyond these employment benefits, the other benefits provided by the Women's Federation are quite limited, thus making it overall into a weak mechanism for incorporation. The second auxiliary mechanism is the All China Federation of Trade Unions. And the Chinese Communist Party, of course, is committed to preventing the rise of independent trade unions because it remembers uh, quite well, and it has studied intensely, the example of the Solidarity Trade Union in Poland, where I mean, at the time when Poland had a population of 36 million in the late 70s, early 80s, there were 10 million members of this independent trade union that um, helped uh, bring down uh, the communist regime. So in China, the All-China Federation of Trade Unions has over 300 million members. Um, 
A very interesting development is the decline in grassroots organizations uh, for the trade union. Um, so between 2017 and 2020, these grassroots organizations declined substantially uh, as presented in the slide. The long-term implications of this decline are uncertain. It's not examined in the literature, it's not analyzed, but you know, it is an empirical uh, fact. So um, the third auxiliary mechanism is, from my point of view, the most interesting. It's also the most powerful and um, a tool for incorporation. And this mechanism is the United Front Work Department. Um, it does a lot of things, um, one of which is it manages the eight minor parties. Um, so China is often uh, presented as a single party regime. Of course, um, it, the Communist Party is the main political entity, but in addition to the Communist Party, there are these eight other parties in China, which are listed on the slide. Um, what we want to keep in mind about them is that they certainly exist, but their membership pales uh, by comparison with the membership of the Chinese Communist Party. So in 2020, they had about 1.3 million members versus the 95 million members for the Chinese Communist Party. However, they do get some seats in the National People's Congress. Uh, this is China's main legislature. And they also get some seats in the second uh, legislature that China has, which is the All China People's Political Consultative Conference. So um, this is consistent with uh, these theories about the importance of legislatures as a mechanism for co-optation of potential rivals, even if the number of seats is fairly limited. Now, the United Front Work Department has some other functions, which are very important and very interesting. Uh, the United Front Work Department manages the old China Federation of Industry and Commerce and the Chambers of Commerce. And um, combined, these two entities um, have 2.6 million members, but those are enterprise members. So those are firms that are members of, of, of the uh, Federation of Industry and Commerce and the Chambers of Commerce. So um, what this does is most of these firms are private firms. Um, this is a mechanism that helps to create bridges to private entrepreneurs, as some scholars have argued. So of the three auxiliary mechanisms uh, for rival incorporation, uh, uh, the argument that I make is that the United Front Work Department is the most successful, the Women's Federation and Trade Union, uh, considerably less so because they have less to offer to their members. So um, moving uh, towards um, some um, uh, concluding uh, thoughts, um, what have we learned um, uh, from this uh, lecture? Um, what is my argument? Well, the Chinese Communist Party um, is successful at rival incorporation uh, because it uh, is capable of uh, ensuring depth of its penetration, as illustrated by its growing size and other indicators. It is also capable of ensuring breadth of penetration, as demonstrated by this broad, broad sectoral penetration that I, I, I presented. However, there's some troubling signs. The party is becoming more elitist, older, and less popular as measured by the number of applications to join it. It has difficulties with minorities, system critical intellectuals, and in places like Hong Kong and Macau. Auxiliary mechanisms exist, um, as I just mentioned. Um, they're less successful than the party, uh, less effective, but they're there and, and they help with incorporation um, to a certain extent of some groups, especially business people through the United Front Work Department. So those are the main arguments of the talk, but I want to end with a final graph and a final question. And this final graph and final question is whether the Chinese Communist Party has peaked in terms of expanding its size. I don't have an answer, um, but I do have um, some empirical indicators on this, on this matter. So in political science, there's some very influential theories by uh, Lu Kanwei and Steve Levitsky that focus on revolutionary origins of um, uh, authoritarian regimes, most of them communist regimes. And they argue that if you're a revolutionary regime, this confers extraordinary organizational advantages and you get to develop these 
big and successful communist parties. This is empirically incorrect, um, uh, but that's not the most important point. So if we look at the non-revolutionary communist regimes, they had significantly larger parties. And you know, here I'm just presenting the case of Bulgaria, but this is true for the entire sample of cases. So it is indeed the non-revolutionary regimes that have bigger parties. And the explanation for that is clear because these parties existed before communism was established and they competed in an electoral marketplace. Um, whereas in the revolutionary regimes, the parties were tiny, 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 and they started to develop after the revolution. So within the realm of revolutionary regimes, the Chinese Communist Party today has 6.7% of the population. So those 95 million members are equivalent to 6.7% of the population. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union at the height of its development in 1988, when it was the biggest it had ever been, had 6.83% of the Soviet population. So 6.83 in the Soviet Union, 6.7 in China today. Cuba, another revolutionary regime, peaked at slightly above 7% of the population in Cuba in 2011, and then its size decreased in uh, 2016 and in 2021. So it's currently uh, under 7% of the population. So it may be the case, I mean, based on these indicators from the Soviet Union and Cuba, that revolutionary communist parties, like the one in China, peak at about 7% of the population. If this is the case, this is not good news for the Chinese Communist Party, but it would be consistent with this drop in applications to join the party, it would also be consistent with having an older base, um, because you know, older people have high mortality than younger people, so they're more likely to exit the party through you know, natural developments like death. So an older party um, is not a party that can grow, um, or that can grow as easily, and a party with fewer applicants certainly also has problems in growing. So I will leave you with, with this question, and I will stop my screen sharing so we can move on to, our, um, to, to Catherine's um, um, discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Martin. Yeah, so Catherine, please. Um, thank you. Um, thank you to Anna. Thank you to Martin. It's really great to be back virtually at the Alexandria Institute and to have this really wonderful opportunity to discuss uh, Martin's uh, book. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. It provided a, um, a clear evaluation of the evolution of the CCP since the Tiananmen Square massacre in uh, 1989 and basically argued that in order to understand the CCP's resilience, we need to understand how it has adapted. Um, Martin has deployed a comparative lens to tease out why the CCP, unlike uh, many other communist parties, has endured. And he argues that uh, the CCP identified four threats to stability following 1989 and correspondingly has made uh, four adaptations. Um, so I'm gonna divide my comments into two parts. Um, I thought, Firstly, since we are, after all, presenting to um, colleagues in an institute of Russia, Eastern Europe and Eurasia studies, uh, I thought it uh, would be interesting perhaps to explain why scholars of Russia should read Martin's book. Um, and for me, certainly, it allowed me to think about how the demise of communism in Russia and in Eastern Europe helps us understand comparatively uh, the CCP's uh, longevity. And then secondly, the second part of my comments uh, will draw my own research into uh, grassroots activities of uh, the CCP uh, in urban China. Um, and I just want to briefly mention three further adaptations that I think have also contributed to the party's longevity. And these are, uh, first of all, its relationship to the government. Um, and secondly, the uh, ide uh, ideological work at the street level. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, the politicization of public policy implementation. So uh, just to quickly um, go through then my uh, the first part, um, I believe that uh, studying China is very important for scholars of Russia. Um, I think that comparing the two countries is a very fruitful endeavor for understanding varieties of authoritarianism and uh, more specifically the factors that contributed to the longevity of the CCP in China compared to the CPSU. And on this, uh, Martin's book is very insightful. Um, it shows how the experience of Russia and Eastern Europe provided an important learning tool for the CCP in each of the four threat areas that he identifies. I'm gonna quickly go uh, through each of them. So 
Uh, the first adaptation that Martin talks about is um, allowing more private uh, activity. So uh, basically, while uh, the CCP allowed more private corporations uh, to operate, they would have to establish party branches within their organizations, rewrite their charters uh, to provide a role for the party uh, in corporate governance. And this adaptation, uh, Martin illustrates in his texts, stands, and I quote, in marked contrast to the experience of post-Soviet Russia, where the oligarchs literally moved into the Kremlin under Yeltsin and, quote unquote, captured the state. So in post-Soviet Russia, then, it was big business that dominated the state, while in China, it's the party state that dominates uh, big business. Um, the second uh, threat and adaptation that uh, Martin notes is the expansion of the social safety net. Um, and here, the CCP expanded welfare programs, reformed the hukou system to the registration system, uh, as well as pension reform, basically having seen how uh, spiraling inequality fed into the domestic pro-democracy movement within China, but also, as Martin states, and I quote, from analysing the experience of Eastern European transitional economies, where the dismantling of the extremely generous social welfare states, along with widespread employment and hyperinflation, bred significant levels of opposition to the market economy and led to the voting out of office of the political elites that were promoting it. So in other words, it was this hollowing out of the welfare state in post-communist Eastern Europe uh, that uh, it was seen to be by the Communist Party of China um, as one of the drivers of political instability and something then that uh, they tried to shore up against. Uh, the third uh, threat and then uh, corresponding adaptation is this idea of promoting indigenous cultural production. Uh, and again, here again, we see how the CCP learned from uh, the collapse of communist regimes in Eastern Europe and in Mongolia. Um, as uh, Martin says, that were ultimately catalyzed by the rise of civil society groups that were rapidly transformed into proto-opposition parties. So again, unlike the ailing Eastern European communist regimes, it was these grassroots independent social organizations that the CCP has then tried to co-opt and uh, absorb. Uh, and then obviously uh, Martin's talk focused on this, this final one, this rival incorporation into the party. Uh, and as Martin uh, stated in his talk, looking at how uh, trade unions such as Solidarity in Poland really were a, a driver of democratization. And then this consequent attempt to um, yeah, incorporate this into the, 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 the party structure. Um, and I find this comparative context uh, really, really uh, useful. Um, it helps us understand why, certainly from the Chinese perspective, but also perhaps more broadly, the communist regimes of Russia and Eastern Europe, why they collapsed. Um, and I guess this is a bit speculative, but I, just as I was sort of thinking about this and, and writing up these comments, I sort of began to reflect on, you know, um, you know, I was a, a, a person who studied Russia before I turned to China, and then I I wonder what has what difference has the collapse of communism actually made to Russia's uh, domestic governance? On, on the one hand, Russia, like China, has really unequivocally become an authoritarian regime. Um, so the collapse of communism has not hugely affected uh, regime type, very broadly speaking, although there are, of course, uh, you know, elections in Russia, uh, very performative elections, of course. Uh, but on the other hand, Russia has a very weak uh, public sector bureaucracy, which poses a significant challenge for regime uh, legitimacy. Uh, while well, by contrast in China, the CCP led uh, public sector it remains a very strong uh, mobilizational force. Uh, and this perhaps of course is why uh, one of the reasons why uh, the Kremlin drives to maintain its domestic legitimacy through uh, for foreign policy adventures. But I'm just gonna move on to the second part of my comments and I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I think there are uh, three further important aspects that also contribute to the CCP's longevity. And they may be useful uh, for you to include, Martin, and perhaps you do elsewhere. Um, so the first one is about how uh, the CCP relates uh, to the government and how has this adapted uh, in order to sustain its longevity. You don't use the term party state in the book, at least I didn't uh, see that, uh, that term. Uh, but the section that I read, it didn't explain how the CCP has become increasingly embedded within government agencies. You looked at uh, party expansion in universities, NGOs, private companies, but not in government bureaucracies. Even though under Xi, we are really seeing this, uh, you know, the party rising above the state to lead all levels of government. And I think the key, um, you know, the key doctrine to look at here is the um, uh, two, uh, 2018 plan on deepening party state and uh, party and state agency reform, uh, which saw the enveloping of state agencies by party bodies and also a transfer of some state functions to the party. I would say this is a substantial adaptation, which has allowed the party to, to increase its strength in China's political system. Um, the second one I would, uh, uh, my suggestion would be to maybe 
Um, just uh, adopt perhaps a somewhat wider understanding of party building. Um, I think to my, to my knowledge, at least, it's not really just about establishing party branches, but also about you know, more broadly cultivating party allegiance within uh, party members through activities such as group study sessions, trips to red tourism sites, volunteering in you know, one's, one's local Xiaotu. Um, and again, this is really laid out in the uh, 2015 opinions on strengthening party building work in social organizations and there's a whole list there of various activities which are seen to kind of comprise uh, party building um, so such things as you know organizing cultural activities that foster a positive atmosphere providing opportunities for talented individuals to advance their careers in alignment with the party um, and so on um, and i would say that it's these sorts of activities which are hard obviously to measure quantitatively but they are really you know uh, an essential part of party building aiming to enhance commitment to and belief in ccp values so although the party itself might be smaller in number you may have members that are more ardent and perhaps more fervently believe in it um, and in this case you might also want to look at the proliferation of party masses service centers uh, which are springing up across uh, you know urban china that basically provide things like childcare, yoga classes, other services that are intended to uh, appeal to busy urban residents. Um, I would say this is a further adaptation that kind of by the CCP to really try to frame itself uh, as relevant to an increasingly uh, you know middle class urban uh, demographic. And then just my last point is um, on uh, policy implementation, and this is stemming from my recent work on. Um, was looking at recycling, but also COVID-19 management at the street level, kind of looking at how the CCP is really using, you know, campaign governance to implement policy initiatives that then uh, go on to serve uh, to politicize policy implementation, linking it to regime legitimacy. And these kind of very kind of efficient and blanket uh, implementation of policies led by the CCP at the grassroots level, I would say is a, a really interesting adaptation from these sort of crude campaigns of the Maoist period, which of course entailed you know, political purges, violent mobilizations uh, and so on, to this kind of technocratic tool of policy implementation, which really are driven, are very results driven. Um, so also those are my three, I guess, uh, aspects of um, CCP longevity that I wondered perhaps had you, had you looked at or, or are they, uh, uh, have you considered them perhaps elsewhere in the book? But uh, just to summarize, I'd say uh, I really enjoyed reading this. I think it's an excellent addition to uh, the literature on uh, CCP longevity and certainly the comparative lens that it um, employs is I think very useful for scholars of communist and post-communist regimes uh, more broadly. Thank you, um, Catherine. Um, Anna, should I respond briefly? I mean, actually I should, I should let you tell us how how you want us to proceed. Um, oh, yes, yes, please, you can go ahead, yes. Yes, well, I mean, first of all, I, I want to thank Catherine for uh, reading uh, the, the portions of this manuscript that I sent her um, so carefully, and for these very thoughtful and, and generous um, comments. Um, this is extremely helpful at this stage uh, of, of writing because I can expand uh, what, what I include. Um, you are correct that um, <laughs> perhaps um, I have a, a bit of a bias towards empirical indicators. I mean, you know, this, this whole talk was tables and graphs and not everything can be measured. And there are many, many things that are not easily measured that are extremely important. Uh, and uh, absolutely thank you for um, these um, uh, uh, for these points about um, street level ideological work. Um, I will definitely include that. Uh, the relationship to the government um, as well. I'm, I'm very uh, grateful for that. And um, I'm always um, keen on, on, on tracing um, continuities with previous periods of, of governance. So this point about um, um, campaign um, style um, um, policy implementation, but also you know the changes in policy implementation, what, you know the ways in which you know the contemporary uh, campaigns differ from from the Maoist is is, is certainly uh, very important. Um, where I might do that in in the manuscript, you know, is you know I'm, I'm a little bit unsure, but the, there is the conclusion as well. Um, so you know certain things can can go there. So um, thank you uh, very much, um, Catherine, for these uh, for these um, thoughtful comments um, and 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 points that I will take on board as I keep working on this project.